Well, since I'm not the boss, but uh, the Croatians are the host, I'm just asking, are we supposed to start? Uh, if not, then won't stop me. We, okay, we, we will then, we'll then start. I mean, uh, I'm Erik Solheim, the head of the OECD the DAC, the club of the uh, world donors, or the most expensive minister, as my former boss, Jens Stoltenberg, said uh, yesterday. But l let me, before I, we go to the panel, let me uh, ask you one, one question, and that's the following. Do anyone know what is the main source of death for young people in the world today, those between 15 and 30? What, what is the main reason why someone is dying? And the suggestion, HIV, malaria, wars. Well, the true answer is road accidents. That's the number one killer for young people in the world. And of course, it shows to us that we, we, we need to be much better in preventing road accidents. But it also shows the enormous success in preventing and curing the main killers of humanity, all the big diseases. And it shows how successful we have been in reducing violence on the planet. Reality is contrary to what everyone, on, basically everyone watching TV or reading newspaper believe. We are living at the most peaceful time in ever in human history. If the history was another country, it was an extremely violent one. There has never ever been such a minuscule chance for any human being dying in violence as in the year of 2015. Adding to that, on development, we have been enormously successful. When I was born, uh, life expectancy in, on average on the planet was 46 years. Today, today it's 70, and in huge Asian nations like China or Vietnam or Indonesia, it has long past 70 as the life expectancy. The average human being is much taller, much fatter, but for good, uh, much better educated, and in much better health than at any other point in human history. I start here because we have been enormously successful both in curbing violence and in pro promoting development. These two are linked, as was the main message from yesterday. We cannot have development without peace. How can that happen? On the other hand, the more affluent, the more prosperous the planet, the less likely we are to go back to wars. And that's the topic of today, how to link development with security and peace. We all know they're integrated, they're not the same, but they are very close to each other. And the topic is how can we promote the common agenda of promoting peace and development at the same time. We have a fantastic panel, but it's huge. Uh, I will encourage you to speak relatively uh, briefly at the opening, if, if you can, so that we can have some exchange of views uh, be between, uh, between you. But it's a panel with enormous experience covering very different nations with very different experience and a, a panel of, of world leaders uh, of the highest order with great experience in the field. Let me start with the Foreign Minister of Turkey, Mevlüt Cavusoglu. Uh, Turkey is, I have to say, my favorite nation, or at least one of the favorite nations of development. You are now far above the average of the OECD nations in the world in promoting development. You, pro you have a much higher percentage of your GDP for development than the average for the rich nation in the world, even being a middle-income country. You are fantastically generous to Syrian refugees. Uh, you have had enormous development back home. Just tell one story, when I was a minister, we had, I had the foreign minister of Bulgaria as a visitor, and he gave me just one paper. And that was a paper about Kayseri capitalism. Uh, the enormous success of the interior of Turkey, or the city of Kayseri, promoting development. So please start uh, on the basis of Turkey's achievement back home but also on the basis of what Turkey is promoting in the world. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, first of all, for the invitation. Uh, I believe uh, the development theme of this year's uh, Croatia's Forum is uh, very re relevant and uh, timely. It is indeed uh, relevant because 2015 uh, marks a very important year in the global development agenda. We are going to have the third international conference on financing for development next week uh, in Addis Ababa. And in September, we will have the UN summit on uh, development uh, in New York. Why do uh, we have such a comprehensive uh, agenda? 
because today safety, security, development have become more closely linked than ever. Conflict brings devastation, deprivation, and poverty. Lack of economic development creates fertile ground for violence and radicalization. None of us immune from adverse effects of these uh, challenges uh, uh, today. Obviously, we cannot stick to the security-only uh, foreign policy. That's why Turkish foreign policy today uh, places development and humanitarian concerns at its uh, center. We consider it uh, as an investment in the future of uh, mankind. Uh, on our part, we realize this investment through three ways. First, we are putting our economic strength to the good use uh, through uh, development aid. Today, we are among the major donors with uh, more than $3.3 billion worth of official uh, development aid. Second, our diplomatic presence, uh, cultural and economic ties with the developing parts of the world are fast increasing. For instance, our trade volume with Africa has increased from $2.9 billion to $23 billion. Now we have 39 embassies in African continent, and TICA, Turkish uh, Cooperation and Development Agency, has 11 offices in different parts of uh, the African uh, continent. Third, we think that development and humanitarian assistance are closely interlinked. Our humanitarian assistance has reached uh, $1.6 billion, uh, making us third biggest donor in the world. Uh, and if you compare this amount to the GDPs of uh, the donors, we are at the uh, top of the uh, list. Our expenditure only for hosting the uh, almost 2 million uh, refugees, for both from Syria and Iraq, as you mentioned, uh, affected by the uh, conflict has already reached to uh, $6 billion. Uh, Therefore, it is no wonder that Turkey will host the very first World Humanitarian Summit uh, next year uh, in May in Istanbul. However, our final aim should be uh, to create an environment where assistance will be uh, needed less and uh, less. Uh, we should enable the low-income and developing countries to, to pursue their development uh, efforts and we should help them build necessary institutional uh, capacity uh, as well. For this, we need an inclusive approach, effective imp implementation, and investing both in infrastructure and human res uh, resources uh, at the global uh, scale. That's why we announce our G20 presidency priorities as the three I's, namely uh, inclusiveness, implementation, and investment for uh, growth. Internally, we want to address inequalities by promoting inclusive growth by taking women and youth on board. Externally speaking, the success of the G20 depends on reaching out uh, to those who are not at the uh, G20 uh, table. How can G20 achieve these goals? Surely by implementing the decisions taken by the G20 at the summits. It is not only a credibility issue, it is also about the impact of our decisions on global financial system and economy. For example, if G20 can fully implement the growth strategies adopted last year in uh, Australia, uh, this will contribute an, an, an additional $2 trillion uh, to the world economy by 2018. Investment, uh, our third eye of the presidency, is also critical uh, both for developed and uh, developing uh, countries. Infrastructure investments are key to achieve uh, sustainable uh, development. Uh, three eyes of the Turkish G20 presidency do not exclude uh, important issues affecting us all. Energy is uh, one uh, such uh, issue. And G20 energy ministers will be meeting for the first time under our uh, presidency. And we know very well that a lack of access to energy affects one-fifth of the population of the world. Another important thematic issue is food security. It is essential to free people from extreme poverty by ensuring food security. And with such an understanding, we organized the uh, G20 Agricultural Ministers meeting uh, in May uh, this year. And they focus specifically on food losses and waste. As you see, uh, we have a comprehensive and ambitious G20 agenda, but our aim is simple. Uh, all this work will give result in Antalya Leader Summit in November. 
Of course, we didn't uh, choose Antalya it's because of my hometown. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> let me conclude by renewing our commitment uh, to sustainable development. Even after our presidents of the uh, G20 is over, uh, we will uh, continue to work for this cause. Uh, but uh, we cannot do it alone, so uh, we need to join our efforts to support the least and developing uh, world. Thank you very much. Th th thank you so much. And true, Antalya is one of the most beautiful uh, uh, cities I've seen. I mean, hard competition with Dubrovnik, of course. I mean, you can have <coughs> a vote at some point. What's the most beautiful city, Antalya or Dubrovnik? I think there would be a draw there, but that was fantastically. Dubrovnik is also not very bad. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> this is my first time, and I like it very much. <coughs> Both are fantastic. Uh, th th thank you for outlining the G20 uh, presidency of Turkey. You will be in the forefront of, of a huge number of, of global events in, in the year to come. And you will also host a humanitarian summit in Istanbul in 2016, which will also be a major, <coughs> major, major uh, glo global event. But I think many people are not really aware of how much Turkey is uh, uh, contributing on the world stage. If you go to Mogadishu, Somalia, there is one nation which is above everyone else. That's Turkey. I mean, I think there are more Turks in Mogadishu than all the others combined. True. Uh, and it shows the, your ability to take risk in a very difficult place and to promote development in a very difficult place. Turkish Airlines, by the way, was also the first airline to set up a lifeline uh, for Somalia to Mogadishu. So you are really contributing in, in difficult places. Thank you. We are then moving on to one of the other big success stories of development. Sweden is... Uh, next to United Arab Emirates. I mean, that is another fact people do not know, but United Arab Emirates is now the biggest provider of development assistance per capita in the world. But you are a good number two, Margot. Uh, so Sweden is also doing very, very well, promoting development, taking a huge number of Syrian refugees uh, uh, to, to Sweden. Uh, but adding to that, Margot is an old friend. She is uh, now also on the uh, Global Panel for Humanitarian uh, Affairs, headed by Kristalina Georgieva. You are declared a Swedish uh, <coughs> feminist foreign policy, as far as I know, as the first uh, um, foreign minister to declare that. So you may touch upon these topics, the humanitar your humanitarian work, the Swedish uh, feminist foreign policy, or whatever else you think is relevant for, for the topic of blending development and, and security. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you to our hosts for having us uh, in this uh, place uh, that we, where I come from in the north of Sweden, would call unnecessarily beautiful. Um, <laughs> you're supposed to show humility, so um, I think that's uh, how we would uh, denote this fantastic uh, place. Thank you for bringing us together and to this um, indeed very um, timely and and relevant theme, as, uh, as my colleague said. Uh, <clears throat> so what can I add to this? I, actually, I, I wanted to start on a little bit more of a pessimistic uh, note, than, but then the chairman set the tone and said that we would look at what has, has changed to the better. Uh, otherwise, there is a rather long list that I think many citizens would be able to, uh, to put up of, of the problems that we see around us in in this world with everything from asymmetric <coughs> conflicts to failed states to, to armament to, um, 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 of course, migration uh, with uh, the number of refugees uh, never having been so many since the end of the Second World War, um, environment and climate change uh, and also pandemies. Uh, women as targets uh, in many of, of today's uh, conflicts and uh, also more of conflicts that concern religion and identity. Uh, and I think that in the end it, it brings us back to the quote of um, the former <coughs> UN Secretary General Dag Hammarskjöld who said that the role of the United Nations is not to, to take humanity to heaven but to prevent it from going to hell. And, um, um, but that's, I guess that's too pessimistic. We <laughs> ought to, to, uh, to show the other side of progress and what we can do. And maybe if you allow me, I would then focus on, on, the two, uh, on two issues. And I think the first one has to do with the fact that without peace, 
uh, no development, and without development, no peace. And to build peace and prevent conflict, you have to address the root causes. And uh, we need to ensure also that policies integrate, uh, including environment and, and climate change, social issues and economic uh, decisions as, as well, that women uh, have the same rights as men and access to, to political, social and economic uh, life as well as to respect labor rights uh, and facilitating also a quality social uh, dialogue. So I think that some of the processes that have been set up will, <coughs> will of course, look at, look at this, and, and that's very important. The international dialogue on peace building and state building being one of them, and we have our development minister as one of the co-chairs in, in that group, and we hope that that would become a very uh, <clears throat> important platform for frank and open dialogue between also fragile states and donors on key reform issues. I have been selected to serve on a high-level panel um, that the United Nations ha have put together, has put together to discuss financing for, uh, for humanitarian assistance. And it comes against the, the, the backdrop and the background of never before having had so many uh, refugees, so many people having to leave their, their home countries for both because of natural disasters but also man-made disasters and, and wars and conflicts. Uh, 40 armed conflicts ongoing, 11 already into full-blown, full-scale wars uh, uh, today. Um, and uh, with uh, fewer donors, um, there are a f just a, a small group of, of donors that continue to, uh, to assist uh, in, within the OECD and, and DAC countries. And we need to mobilize uh, more, more money, more resources to, to help these people. Um, and that's why we are in this group looking at, uh, of course, uh, private donors as, as well. Uh, who will give what to whom, and how do we build trust? Because it, it's uh, very much a matter of trust, to know that the money really is well spent, that we don't continue with the kind of compartmentalized uh, approach that has been uh, uh, existing until, until now, uh, that we are more transparent about how money uh, is being used, uh, but really to uh, be able to ask donors today to provide support for, on average, from 7 to 17 years in, in, in general. And that is, of course, uh, quite a, a task to say that you have to, to hold on for, for that long to actually be able to offer humanitarian, uh, humanitarian assistance. And today we can uh, actually say that the system is broke with the words of Guterres, uh, the High Commissioner for Refugees. He says that the system is broke. There is not enough money even to provide food to people living in, in camps around the world. So of course we, we have to do something. And if you ha have ideas and, uh, um, and view, strong views on this, I would welcome that because I will immediately bring it back to, to the panel. But this is one of the tasks that we have also to, provide, to be able to provide development because there is a link between development and humanitarian assistance as well. We ought, for example, to invest much more in education and we can do it already in some of these IDP uh, camps or, or refugee camps around the world. We ought to start already there to, to provide education. And my other point is really the one of of including uh, women. Maybe this is too predictable for to, coming from me, others ought to say it, and thank you for saying it, that we, we need to, to engage women. And it is as simple as it is an analysis of the fact that women are still being discriminated against and they do not enjoy the same rights. They are not represented. They are not uh, getting the resources uh, c compared to, to men and boys around the world. And I think at the same time, we all know by now that they are crucial to, uh, for example, making sure that we can reach a sustainable peace. And uh, unfortunately, the truth is also that in all the ongoing peace uh, um, negotiations, women are very rare around the, the table. And also as signatures to, 
to, uh, to peace agreements. So this is something that we can and must improve. And unfortunately today also sexual violence, and since I have been working a lot on that also as a UN Special Representative, I can say that that has become a very, uh, the weapon of choice because it is silent and very effective uh, and uh, it creates uh, scars that um, and tears apart the fabric of a society and lives on for a very long time. It is not only a tactic of war, but now also a tactic of terror. And uh, this is why um, it is a task on all of us as political leaders around the world to look at what we can do to improve um, uh, the, the situation and the role of, of women around the world. So thank you very much for inviting me and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Th thank you, uh, Margot. I, I believe maybe, you may you correct me if I'm wrong, that the debate on whether the world is progressing <coughs> or regressing is fairly easy to, <coughs> to resolve. Uh, I think there is very, very strong statistical evidence that on average ev nearly everything is going in the right direction. But of course that doesn't help the mother in South Sudan or in Syria who saw her children uh, dying yesterday in violence to tell her that someone in Europe in a plush hotel uh, mm -hmm. are sitting there saying that on average we are doing very well. Uh, I can tell you it will not convince the mother in Malakal in, in, in South Sudan, not, not, for, not for the slightest second. So the fact that we are doing very well should just inspire us to do even more, look into what have been the success factors, how can we do more of what was successful and for sure how can we avoid uh, the mistakes of, of, of humanity. Thank you for bringing up women. Uh, we are not tired of that. It's necessary to do it over and over again. Mm -hmm. Thanks and conti please continue, Margot. We are then moving on to Portugal. Uh, the f foreign minister uh, here yesterday said that uh, small donors can do a lot. Portugal is uh, a much smaller donor than Turkey and, um, uh, and uh, Sweden. But you are a major donor in some places. Last week I visited Guinea-Bissau, uh, one of the poorest nations on the planet. Uh, and there is no one assisting Guinea-Bissau as, as Portugal. So it relates to the fact that though you are not United States, America, or China. You cannot be everywhere. Uh, you can play an enormous, uh, you can play an enormous, important role in some areas. So Portugal is <coughs> doing a lot. You may touch upon this or what, whatever other topic is of your interest. But uh, Mr. Ru Marchete, Minister of State and Foreign Affairs from Portugal, please. Thank you. Uh, allow me uh, first of all to, to, to thank the, the first deputy prime minister and minister of foreign and European affairs of Croatia, uh, my dear friend Vesna Pucic, for the invitation to participate in this important forum, which gives us the opportunity to jointly reflect on this extremely relevant and timely subject. This has a, a theoretical aspect and uh, some practical aspects. Uh, for Portugal, the link between foreign security and development policies is clear-cut, like the three vertices of a pyramid built to ensure sustainable peace and stability, social and economic growth, democracy, and respect to all forms of human rights. Unless these policies are effectively combined in a truly strategic manner, we risk providing only a partial and short-term answer to the increasingly complex and interrelated challenges that we face. But we need to distinguish uh, uh, between what is uh, a development policy uh, directed to African countries, mainly the, the, some Lusophone countries, such as uh, Guinea-Bissau, for instance, <coughs> where there is an absolute necessity to build up again the state and to, uh, 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 to reestablish peace. Because, as has been said, uh, without peace it's not possible to, to, make, uh, uh, to develop a, a policy that will increase uh, <coughs> the, 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 the product and will, will create the conditions uh, for economic development. But if in Africa we can see the relationship uh, between, uh, uh, between security and uh, the economic aspect and still the approach that the most important uh, aspect is the economic one, uh, linked with security, because without peace, as I said, it's not possible to be efficient. There are today new phenomena 
For instance, in Europe we have threats about, uh, uh, about terrorism, about migration, where it's quite clear that the, the, foreign, uh, the, the foreign policy, the security policy, and the development uh, policies are interconnected. And that uh, we can distinguish between what are the, the immediate action that is necessary, for instance, against Daesh, because if Daesh will uh, uh, establish a territory, will become a state uh, with much bigger problems than if it is only a terrorism uh, movement. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, uh, migration, for instance, is, is, is even uh, more clear because we have uh, problems that are immediate, that are humanitarian. This is to, under the pressure of the events, it is absolutely necessary to do to some actions that uh, are absolutely necessary to do now. And there are other aspects that require that in the, the, the countries where the, this migration <coughs> movements are originated, they can, they can find out ways to develop economically. So uh, the models are not unique. Uh, some today present uh, uh, the importance uh, uh, of the, the economic aspect still as traditionally has been presented. Others uh, give more relevance to the foreign policy and to the security. Uh, but all of them recognize that there is an interdependence and an interrelation. And this has been, uh, to a certain extent, during a long, a long time, neglected because people were very much preoccupied to establish distinctions to better describe the situation. But today, uh, after that, we cannot abandon that method methodology, but we need to, to distinguish to the interconnections and to treat the things as a whole. That is different if we, if, if we address the problem of terrorism or if we address the problem of migration or if you address the classical problem of the underdevelopment in Africa. Uh, so, what, which I consider very interesting in this forum is that it initiated a very, a very uh, rich uh, problematic of uh, some differences that are essential to, to adopt an efficient policy. And uh, the answers are completely different. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the, <coughs> the, the questions are, are, are done by the forum under the title of a, 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 a new development policy towards partnership and a common vision. And this fact means that many aspects of the development policies, or the former development, traditional development policies, must today be seen not, not, uh, uh, not so much as an action of uh, one actor, one state, but as a whole of states that have co a coordinated policy to attain some results. This is very important, and this is the case, for instance, of the threats that we now face in Europe, but two, the, the magnitude of the problems in Africa require that an action will be developed in coordination with other countries, and, uh, and uh, uh, these aspects of uh, foreign security and development uh, uh, policies, uh, interrelations and interdependencies will be much more clear. I think that uh, uh, this new aspect must be underlined and must be researched more deeply because this is something new recently in, in, in many aspects of the policy of, of development. Uh, so if it is relatively easy when we consider the problems, uh, to take the example I, give, I have given, <coughs> previously about Guinea-Bissau, where it is clear that there are two problems. One problem of to submit the military to the rule of law, so the security. Second, to, to keep, to keep the, the sovereignty of Guinea-Bissau, though with all the difficulties. And third, to have the, develop, the economic development, and this are interconnected, but this interconnection is not so clear unless in what sense peace, on the threats that today or challenges for Europe, it's completely different in what concerns migration and terrorism. Uh, and, uh, uh, and generally speaking, this new model must be studied and to a certain extent rebuilt our ideas about the, the a methodology that must be more efficient. Thank you. Th thank you. And Portugal, of course, is focusing most of its aid to the Lusophone world. 
uh, but there is a number of success stories there where you ca which you could potentially assist uh, in uh, promoting. I mean, two of the most successful peace processes in the last decade, have, uh, two decades, have been in Lusophone countries. I mean, in, I mean, and fantastically successful in East Timor, as well as in Mozambique. Both nations are now at peace. Very successful. Portugal has contributed, so I think we should um, work on sharing these experiences. And if I may add, last, <coughs> last week there was an enormous crisis in Guinea-Bissau. Uh, everyone thought the Prime Minister and the President will fall up, uh, go into full, uh, full uh, coalition. It, it, it didn't end that way. They have now, now decided to work together and it seems very promising. And I think Portugal worked very, very hard with your ambassador, your president, others uh, to achieve that result. So it, it shows you can do a lot. You, you are right. In East Timor, it's clear that there are, <clears throat> there are interrelations between foreign policy and security, mainly in what concerns uh, they're very, uh, uh, its very powerful neighbors, <laughs> and aspects of development not and education, and the role of the women, as has been underlined. And in Mozambique, it's, it's the same in a rather complex society because uh, if in Angola, in Angola, for instance, you have uh, practically uh, a certain homogeneous uh, society, uh, in, in Mozambique, it's quite different uh, with, with inf many influences and uh, more than one predominant religion. There is not, probably speaking, a predominant religion. Uh, so the problems become more and more complex, and this require uh, a whole, a whole model, as I said, uh, to to tackle with this problem in, in a more efficient way. Thank you. Uh, we are then moving a bit closer, maybe, to Croatia uh, and to a nation with a lot of experience from historically a difficult uh, part of the world. Uh, I take the liberty before I give the floor to the Hungarian uh, <coughs> Foreign Minister uh, Peter Sijarto uh, to bring up one uh, personal issue with you. You are now the one and only Visegrad country which has not joined our club of donors, the DAC, the Poles have joined, the Slovaks and the Czech, but not Hungary. It's time for you to join us. <laughs> you, you may comment upon that, but then you have the floor. Good morning. <laughs> First of all, uh, thank you very much for this invitation, uh, Wesna and Joško. Uh, I really do appreciate that uh, um, you gave me the chance uh, <coughs> to express uh, my views um, on a lot of topics uh, like uh, you were just kind enough to uh, uh, raise um, before um, giving me uh, the floor. I totally agree with you that uh, we have been experiencing um, historic challenges in uh, Central um, Europe. We are living in a very um, exciting place uh, of the world, not just because of being neighbors to Croatia, that gives us enough excitement, but, uh, but r rather than uh, the whole region is in a very um, exciting situation. Um, not just because uh, uh, the growth of European Union in the future should come from this uh, region, rather than um, because uh, we can feel the challenges which Europe is facing um, from the front line, actually. And um, literally and um, philosophically uh, as well. Because here is the um, um, issue of migration, which is uh, very, very closely uh, interdependent and interconnected to, uh, to the uh, development policies. Because nowadays everyone speaks uh, about the migration issue in, in Europe uh, and Greece, uh, but uh, no one speaks about uh, uh, the challenges that Central Europe uh, has to face in this respect. Since everyone speaks about Italy and Greece facing challenges, but Hungary uh, has the most migrants coming in since the beginning of this year. Uh, the morning of today, uh, we had uh, 74,000 migrants coming into Hungary illegally. 99% uh, of them uh, through Serbia, which is not a bilateral issue, of course, because these migrants are coming mainly from Pakistan, Afghanistan, Eritrea, Syria, uh, North Africa, uh, Middle East. They come through um, Greece or uh, Bulgaria as an EU member state, and then through Macedonia, Serbia to Hungary where we register them, of course, because we have to comply with all EU regulations. But what happens, they leave the country 
and then within one or two months, they're going to be sent back by the Austrians or the Germans. Uh, so uh, now we are in a kind of double pressure from South and, uh, and from the West. So that puts us in a very, very uh, complicated situation in order to join any kind of uh, quotas or join um, any kind of um, uh, requirements regarding uh, relocation or uh, resettlement because we have the most migrants uh, coming uh, in into uh, a single European Union uh, member uh, state. So we are very happy to, uh, to take part in any kind of uh, development programs uh, together with the V4 countries, together with Croatia. But first, we have to um, tackle a challenge uh, which uh, is now more or less recognized by European Union as well because now it has been said that Hungary is in a special uh, situation in this respect because you have to be recognized to be in a spe special situation when you have the most migrants coming uh, into, um, into your uh, country. So I think that here the de development policy of European Union has a very important role because we, we, need to, uh, we need to address here the root causes uh, and not only the symptoms, because if we address only the symptoms, um, that will give no uh, solution at the end of the day. So what we have to do that when we spend uh, billions of euros of the European taxpayers, including Croatians, Hungarians, Swedish, uh, Portuguese, and all the others, uh, then we should stick uh, that to conditionality saying that when we spend these Euro billions of euros uh, on development programs in Africa, in Middle East, or um, any other um, uh, source countries of migration, then we should say, okay, you have to spend this money that will end up in a result uh, that uh, <coughs> abolishes those reasons why these people have to leave their countries. So uh, uh, these development programs should, be, uh, should have a real impact on the economic and political situation uh, in these um, uh, countries because, uh, um, because Margot is right when she says uh, uh, there's no development without peace and no peace without development. Uh, she is totally right because we need peace and economic development uh, in order to, uh, to, to get these people in a situation when they are not uh, forced uh, to leave their homes. Because if you, uh, if you approach to the migration issue from a humanitarian point of view, uh, then uh, I understand that the first violation of the human dignity is when a family with small children is forced to leave uh, their homes. Regardless, it's a political or economic reason, but is, it is a violation of human dignity uh, that they have to uh, leave their homes. And here I think we should make a very clear distinction between political refugees and economic migrants, because as you have, told, uh, as you have said, Hungary uh, has experienced a lot of exciting times during uh, uh, her, her history, and um, based on these experiences, uh, we have always been ready uh, to give shelter to uh, political uh, refugees because we had a lot of political refugees. They had to leave Hungary uh, even in the last uh, century and there were countries all over the world including US, Canada and the Western European countries or Sweden uh, to give shelter uh, to these people. So we, we always give shelter to, um, to, uh, uh, to the political refugees. And here I would like to um, address the threat of terror as well that was addressed by the speakers uh, um, prior to me. I have to tell you that uh, since Paris and Copenhagen, I think we don't have to waste too much time to explain to the European people that it is a daily threat on the life of, uh, of Europe. Uh, before that, we have just seen it on TV, what is going on in the Middle East. But now we understand that the stability in the Middle East has a daily impact on the life of uh, European people. So uh, I think we have to, uh, we have to increase our efforts uh, in order to combat terror. Uh, in Africa and in the um, in Middle East um, as well. Remember, peace does not come without development, but development does not come without peace. And in order to gain peace in these territories, we have to fight terror. That's why Hungarian Parliament has decided, which is another contribution, another type, um, that uh, Hungarian Parliament has decided to send 150 troops uh, to Iraq um, uh, to fight. So uh, if I can give you the ball, then we would be very happy if our friends would join us uh, in, this, in this effort as well. Thank you. Th th thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, one challenge which you are touching upon is, of course, that 
uh, the uh, development as a way to create peace is on their long-term solution. It cannot, it cannot happen in, in one day. On, in the long-term, development is promoting peace. So there, is, there is no doubt. There is a very, very strong statistical uh, co uh, coefficient between, between development and peace, but on the long term. While the issues are immediate. I mean, the people are running from Syria today, uh, not in 10 or 15 or 20 years' time, now. So, and we tend to then move the money into the immediate solutions rather than into the, to the long term. So th these are some of the challenges uh, Margot's panel also will have to, have to look into, how we can make certain that we answer the long term and the short term challenges at the same time. It's a very, very big challenge, I think, but it comes from your, your contribution. Thank yeah. you. You didn't answer when you will join the DAC? Even me? You, you didn't answer the question on when you will join our club of the donors? Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> we will. Thanks. <laughs> but uh, you, you spoke about uh, long-term uh, long solutions. Uh, on the short-term solutions, uh, I, I think that if you, if you do it silent, it should be that effective as well. So we, we never made announcement about uh, giving shelter to, uh, to people running for their lives, actually, from various uh, countries of the world. Uh, but we made it. We are proud of it, but we're never, never going to announce it. But we will surely um, uh, join your efforts. Th th thanks. We are then moving on to uh, another uh, nation which had a lot of challenges recently. Of course, tomorrow all eyes of the entire world will be focused on, on Srebrenica, uh, uh, obviously, and uh, the biggest atrocity ever, <coughs> ever in Europe since the, since the Second uh, World War. Uh, so you have a... Uh, you will have a <coughs> lot, 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 there will be a lot, 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 lot of interest, but you have a, the mo most recent experience in, in Europe with, with difficulties and wars, and you have come out of that, and you may have a lot, lot to, to share to the, to the, to the global, global public opinion as to how to get out of dif difficult challenges. So, next speaker is uh, Igor uh, uh, Shnardak, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Bosnia-Herzegovina. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, first of all. Uh, let me uh, let me thank uh, my dear colleague Vesna for for wonderful wonderful work with the Croatia Forum. It it's become obviously a, a huge event, and uh, I think the issues and the themes that we have uh, in these few days uh, on the table are uh, very well uh, picked and uh, come at the right time. So. Uh, as always, it's a bit frustrating when you have to work in a surrounding like this with all the beaches and, and pools around us, but what can we do? It's not the first time. Uh, so yes, you said it uh, right. Tomorrow is 20 years from uh, Srebrenica. Uh, in, and also, uh, a little bit later, we will be celebrating 20 years of peace in Bosnia and Herzegovina. It's a, it's a big, big thing. 20 years is... Uh, you know, when you look at through history, uh, maybe it's not a long period of time, but uh, in one lifetime, and when you see what can be done, what can be achieved in 20 years and two decades, it's a, it's a long time. Uh, I have to say I read recently a book uh, with a story being set in the UK in the late 60s. And... Uh, I was thinking, even even at that time, I didn't know about this uh, panel today. I was thinking, reading the book, you know, where the UK was 20 years after the war. They had industrial boom. They had a great joy of life among people. They had Beatles and other pop groups making great entertainment for them. And uh, they were already a long way uh, from the beginning in integration process with the countries that were in war with. Uh, unfortunately, uh, today, if you come to Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, one of the rare things that you, can, that you will hear in the same uh, way in Sarajevo, in Banja Luka, in Mostar, or any other city, uh, will be that uh, people are expected to live much better 20 years after the war. And uh, they, they expect it to be much more integrated, much more free, much better off, <coughs> just to say it like that. So uh, you're, you're right. Uh, we do have some experiences to share on this. And uh, 
I'll, I'll, I'll try to do, do something like that in these few minutes. Uh, first of all, we are at the moment chairing the Council of Europe. I want to underline this because for us it's a great honor. And uh, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, especially the new government that was in power, that is in power only for the last three months, will try to uh, really be up to, up to this and to show that, uh, after all, we can be uh, credible credible partners. We can be uh, the country that takes over some responsibility and, and pushes it through. Uh, I'm glad some of the themes close to our priorities were mentioned, and uh, the role of women is, is uh, very high on our priorities with some very specific, uh, some very specific uh, issues like uh, the implementation of the Istanbul Convention, the combating the violence against women, and the role of women in the European film, and also intercultural dialogue, something that we uh, feel is very important at this moment of time from the Bosnia-Herzegovina perspective. Uh, I think <clears throat> probably Bosnia and Herzegovina and this region is one of the best regions to talk about the connection uh, among security policy, foreign policy, uh, development policy, and uh, I think that we we showed that uh, that uh, things can be done in the right way. Uh, I think that uh, this region, because of its history, because of its uh, uh, specific uh, characteristics can be really uh, can be really uh, you know the 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 place where some problems can start, but also can be a pillar of stability and prosperity for this part of Europe. And I think, uh, looking now at the entire region, we are on the right way to do it. Uh, I think uh, Igor will speak next, but I think uh, uh, his country and uh, their uh, their uh, wish to become the full member, member of uh, NATO. And the support, for example, that Montenegro is getting uh, is, 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 is a good example of this. For example, you have Serbia with its position of neutrality. You have Bosnia and Herzegovina that has very good uh, relations and uh, in intensive cooperation with NATO, but no consensus on the final decision of, uh, of, the, uh, of the full accession. Uh, both these countries gave full support uh, to Montenegro because uh, uh, we all felt that this, uh, this contribution to regional stability that would come through this is, is very important. And uh, uh, I think that also shows that things can be done in a, in a, in a different way. Uh, when it comes to Bosnia and Herzegovina, I would like to say that uh, we had a very, good, a very good start of the new government with the uh, reforms being at, uh, at the center of attention. But I think also uh, the situation in the last month showed how uh, we, we shouldn't take uh, this, this positive, uh, positive uh, momentum as, as, uh, to take it as, the, as granted, because uh, uh, it showed uh, that uh, we are still very fragile. And uh, in only a few weeks, uh, with the uh, with the political tensions, uh, political tensions with uh, this resolution on Srebrenica in uh, Security Council in UN, uh, with the arrest of, of Nasser Oric, after that cancelling of the visit of President of Serbia to Sarajevo at the very last minute, and also postponing uh, our uh, signing of our initial reform uh, program, initial reform agenda, uh, created created quickly a very bad. A uh, very bad situation when it comes to uh, political political terms and uh, political stability. Also, we could see uh, we could see recently uh, that uh, that uh, the situation between countries also can be can 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 be. I will not say uh, that relations would be stopped, but that it can be in danger uh, with just one event, and then usually we get uh, the. Usually we get the one reaction, and then this reaction leads to another reaction. So it's it's very important to be to be to be calm. I think the politicians in the region, the politicians in Bosnia and Herzegovina, should mostly uh, give their give their contribution to keeping things uh, calm. We should have a look through to the future, and I think it's very important that we 
uh, have this uh, development uh, focus uh, in front of us. Uh, that's why it is so important uh, for Bosnia and Herzegovina. I, I know that it stands also for the other countries that are member of this big uh, net of uh, infrastructure investments that are uh, being prepared that should be verified at so-called uh, uh, Vienna, Vienna uh, conference in uh, August 27th. And this is something that is really welcomed by everybody. And the infrastructure projects that we are uh, looking at in Bosnia with uh, roads, uh, the, the, the tra train the rails, uh, railways, and also the, uh, the, the ports, the reconstruction and making some new ones, those are the things that, that really are seen as, 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 as good by everybody. Nobody can challenge that. And uh, we will try to, 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 to focus on this. So my uh, final uh, point is that, uh, at least for this region, for, for my country and uh, for uh, our surrounding, is that there is no alternative to improving our relations, to uh, move with, with uh, further reconciliation and uh, with joint effort to bring more economic growth and bring more prosperity to everybody living here, no matter what country. Thank you. Th th thank you so much and thank you for underlining what, what you're doing to promote reconciliation and, and to move, move on af after all, all the atrocities in, in, uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina and uh, wish you well with the, uh, with the uh, anniversary to tomorrow which will attract a lot of interest and the men of the ministers will, 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 will go there. It also underlines a global phenomenon because we, we tend to focus, as rightly Margot said, on the conflict areas. But we tend to forget that there is now, with the conflict coming to an end in Colombia, there is complete political peace from Alaska to uh, the land of fire. The entire American continent is at peace. So is basically all nations in East Asia. So is nearly all South Asia. And South and East Asia is half humanity, so that's not a small, small piece of the globe. Where the nearly all conflicts are is in a belt starting with Afghanistan, through the Middle East, and through the Sahel. Southern Africa, by the way, is also completely at peace. So this that part of the world where all conflicts are, but I think sharing experiences from how this uh, uh, Southeast Asia come out of conflict can be essential uh, to, uh, to encourage others to, to l learn from your successes. Basically, it's a success story. For sure, you have, as everyone else, also made mistakes which others can learn from. So, but please come forward and share share your experiences from from Bosnia and Herzegovina, but uh, much widely from, from this region. We are then moving on to Montenegro. I know that your priority now is to join NATO and the EU, and you are also Minister for, minister for uh, Foreign Affairs as well as for Euro European Integration, so you are really at the center, uh, cent center of this, but please share your, uh, your perspectives. Igor Lucic, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs and European Integration in uh, Montenegro. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Good morning to all. Uh, it's, it's great to be back at Croatia Forum, and I think uh, the topic selected for this, deba for this debate, for this panel, is really a great one because uh, it, it helps us share uh, different views and different experiences, which point to the same direction. And uh, some of the previous speakers have already uh, pointed out that uh, foreign policy, security, development policy are pretty much interconnected. And uh, in case of Montenegro, joining NATO, as you mentioned, or EU, is an uh, uh, incredibly important step forward into bringing that mosaic really full. Uh, membership to the NATO, which uh, provides with uh, 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 security, and security is uh, uh, a precondition for institutional building, and, uh, and, and all that together, it is a precondition for economic prosperity in the long run. Of course, uh, membership in an institution per se uh, doesn't mean anything unless you fill that framework with real contents, and it is also uh, uh, pro-business policies, it is also, uh, 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 as we will talk about it later this year on, on the final structure of SDGs, it is also making sure that we meet SDGs and so on and so on in order to make it a really a balanced approach to the development of every society. But uh, it was interesting to hear last night at the opening that, for example, Croatia 
which used to be a receiver of official development assistance, has now turned to being an exporter of official development assistance. So transition can be seen in different angles, and this one is quite a practical one, because Montenegro also still uses some bits of uh, official development assistance, uh, and probably will just uh, uh, soon graduate, and we won't have any of these, uh, unless you count IPA, Instrument for Pre-Accession, into that, but let's put it, that, let's put it aside. It's interesting to see how the structure of official development assistance moves on with, with uh, the transition a country, uh, the transition stages country passes through over time. Uh, at the first stage, it's uh, dealing with immediate post-conflict uh, projects, uh, programs, whatever. And then as time goes by, it's more about supporting civil society, about supporting rule of law, and so on. Uh, we're not talking a lot about uh, uh, migration pressures. Uh, this region, Europe, given the, the MENA region problems and so on. I'd like to remind you that at some point uh, in Montenegro, we had 20% of the refugees, 20% of the population were refugees. And it was in 99 due to uh, NATO intervention. But it, was, it started actually in the early 90s when uh, internally space people and refugees came from Croatia from, from Bosnia Herzegovina. And even today, we still have two to three percent of population who are refugees. Uh, just imagine in the European Union of 500 million, you have 15 million people, refugees. It's a daunting prospect. Uh, and actually, the, the, the real number is bigger because a lot of the people have, in the meantime, integrated to the society. Uh, because some had family roots, some uh, managed to, to fully integrate, and, and so on and so on, different reasons. But it's being a challenge, and uh, it is still a challenge because it is, it, we need to handle that. Uh, you need to provide with social security uh, standards and so on and so on. Plus, some of those people, a big number of the, uh, a big chunk of it is Roma population, which is very vulnerable and we need to provide with uh, adequate support, integration to, to full integration to the society and so on and so on. So I'm, I'm pointing this out because uh, in, in, in our experience, I think one can see uh, different stages of transition and one can see an interesting experience that can be shared, shared also uh, uh, more broadly. Uh, we, I think that, that when uh, talking about, again, when talking about uh, uh, NATO membership and further on European uh, Union membership, as it uh, hopefully will come in, in, in some years' time, we are actually talking about making sure that, that Montenegro is a country which is on the Western Balkans, but at the same time Mediterranean country, can afford to have, uh, can afford to attain, uh, uh, you know, top-notch level of uh, security and it is a, a, a precondition for anything else. It is a precondition for anything else. It is also interesting to, to uh, follow this process as it, as it unfolds in parallel to uh, the new post-2015 uh, agenda, which is a new, new development agenda for the whole world. And SDGs is something that uh, some people think is too complex, uh, very difficult to follow. Some. Uh, uh, would like that there is, uh, 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 you know, uh, instead of 17, uh, five or six or up to uh, 10, uh, very clear, easy to, to follow goals and so on and so on. Some uh, will say that MDGs were better structured and, and, uh, 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 and uh, better flat platform and so on. But whatever the debate is and, and whatever it ends, it will end soon and every, every country I had will have uh, number of SDGs to uh, to meet, and although countries are different, uh, and and uh, uh, some will find it easy to meet some of the goals, some find it very difficult and complex to meet some other goals. One of the goals that is inside of those 17 is actually rule of law. It's actually about peace. It's about security, because it is a necessary and and elementary precondition for anything else. And whatever we do uh, in this particular field, whatever the country's name is, is we're talking, talking this is an this is in, incredibly important precondition that should uh, uh, enable, enable uh, uh, attaining standards in, in other, other fields. Therefore, you know, 
uh, in our case, foreign policy priorities, NATO, EU, it's, it has incredibly a lot to do with internal agenda, and it has to do with development agenda. And, 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 that, uh, and, and it clearly shows that whatever the point in this big transition, which actually philosophically never ends, but in this, this transition you're in, uh, this interconnectedness, it, it is so, so obvious. Thank you. Th th thank you so much for setting out priorities from Montenegro. You're also pointing to a phenomenon which is the complete change of global development assistance because historically that was a few basically North European nations with the United States and Japan providing assistance to a vast majority of poor people out there. Uh, it's completely changed. It's a small group of nations which are just donors. I mean, Sweden is a prime example. There is also another small group of nations which are just uh, recipients, say Malawi or, or Zambia. And then there is a vast group of nations which are providers and recipients at the same time. So there is nothing wrong with Montenegro or Croatia uh, receiving assistance and providing assistance at the same time. Turkey, by the way, is a prime example of that. Still, Turkey is receiving assistance from, say, Germany, which is linked to the, uh, the, to the transfer of technology, where Germany is maybe still somewhat more advanced than, than, uh, than uh, Turkey, while Turkey is providing a lot of assistance to well, man, many of the Central Asian nations, but as well to many African nations, like, like I said, Somalia. So this, this is a new world. And it's a much, more, much better, much, uh, uh, much more fascinating, much more democratic world than, than the previous one. And I think, please, please, Montenegro, please, Croatia, take your place in this and uh, start providing assistance, increase your assistance, while don't be ashamed of rec receiving assistance at the same time. There's nothing wrong uh, with, with, that, uh, with, with, that, with that view. Uh, we are then moving on to another nation which have had uh, huge success, but in a challenging uh, neighborhood, which is, uh, which is Georgia. Uh, you are uh, in for sure in a challenging neighborhood, everyone knows that, but there has been an <coughs> enormous progress in, in, in um, Georgia uh, since uh, I, I visited you in the 1990s. I know there has been fantastic progress since that time. It's a fantastically beautiful place. I mean, really uh, one of the paradise places on, on Earth, uh, uh, Georgia. So please, the floor, floor is yours. Tamar uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs. Thank you very much for your kind words. I would like to join all the previous speakers in thanking our uh, host, Dia Vesna, for uh, the hospitality and opportunity for me for the first time to be part of uh, Dubrovnik Forum, um, uh, which already well established as an excellent uh, platform for debate and discussion on the regional and the global issue, issues. And today's theme also of, of our debate is uh, exactly the example of that. So um, I want to, uh, coming back to the question of our panel, um, uh, I believe we are in the country which is the perfect example uh, of the interconnection and interdependency uh, of the security, foreign policy and development. Croatia that went through difficult uh, transformation, security tensions, uh, today is a successful member of the European Union and the NATO and is already uh, share, uh, started to share its experience with the world, as it was mentioned yesterday by uh, the Madam uh, Minister of Croatia. So Georgia is uh, following the same way and uh, declaring uh, foreign policy priority European and Euro-Atlantic integration, which requires very serious efforts and dedication and very serious support from our friends and partners. This is the way we are following because we truly believe that this is the way that expands democracy, prosperity and stability in the country and in the region. Uh, but concerning to the theme we are discussing, I want to refer the European security strategy as well as 2005 European consensus on development that acknowledges that there cannot be sustainable development without peace and security and uh, that without development and poverty eradication there will be no sustainable peace and that was the issue that was referred by previous speakers as well. 
Uh, that was this understanding that underpinned development and stability for Europe for more than half of decade, half of century. Economic and security assistance provided the foundations of political and economic integration. This integration, in turn, did not only stimulate economy, but also provided security and stability necessary for development of liberal and democratic institutions. With the end of the Cold War, uh, it was tempting to lower attention paid to the security side of the equation in favor of the economic development. Today, however, we all see and agree that uh, security agenda remains paramount. The post-Cold War international order is visibly declining, endangering peace and security uh, across the European continent. European uh, international norms and principles are repeatedly ignored and borders are redrawn by force. This is reality today in the European continent. In practice, I want to remind the audience, everything is started uh, not in Ukraine, but much more earlier, in 2008, with Russian invasion to Georgia, which ended up with occupation of 20% of our territory and now the steps towards annexation. And this fragile sit situation is the environment uh, where Georgia continues to irreversibly follow its European and uh, Euro-Atlantic uh, choice and choice for development on European way, uh, choice for the Georgian people, because as I said, we truly believe that this is the way for development, democracy, stability, and security in the region. To this end, we uh, undertaken very serious reforms, and Georgia now, we are very proudly say that it's a successful example of transformation with uh, uh, very good results on open governance, fight against uh, corruption, um, uh, also um, um, reforms in the justice and the rule of law, free media, human rights, also uh, the uh, liberal economic reforms providing favorable investment destination. But all that definitely will not happen if uh, not very serious uh, engagement and support of all our donors. And I would like to particularly stress the importance of engagement during all these years, European Union, European Union member states, uh, uh, United States, uh, uh, Turkey, Japan, and number of international organizations that seriously contributed to the uh, Georgia's development. From our side, we guarantee maximum transparency, uh, the best coordination and engagement of all the players to get maximum benefits of the development cooperation efforts of all our partners. And uh, now this uh, support uh, particularly from the EU and EU member states, uh, as well as the United States, and we are very happy that uh, there is very close coordination uh, on uh, Georgia's development and particularly implementation of association, ad uh, association agenda uh, between the European Union and uh, the United States, because it's absolutely critical to get maximum efficiency of assistance. Uh, uh, Georgia, uh, after signing a uh, historic association agreement with the European Union, embarked in a very serious transformation um, uh, by introdu introducing European norms and standards, uh, uh, convergence of economic policy, approximation with the European acquis, which requires massive engagement and the know-how from uh, European uh, donors uh, and uh, as well as other donors. And this is extremely important to follow this reform path uh, of the Georgian government by relevant instruments, financial support, uh, and uh, assistance based on the principles of the more for more. So we are very much committed to that process. And uh, I hope we will have a very successful outcome. But at the same time, these uh, efforts uh, depend on internal political will and dedication, but at the same time depends on external framework. Our partners' active role in our region is essential to defend the framework upon which the peace and 
security in Europe is based. In this regard, continuation of strong political support and opening clear European perspective, as well as the next step towards NATO membership is of critical importance. Uh, to this end, uh, we believe that next NATO summit will, uh, will be very important in terms of acknowledging Georgia's um, reform efforts and or would result to the firm decision to start membership action process, which will be extremely important for, uh, for Georgia's development and will have a serious uh, impact on security and stability. But um, I want to particularly stress on the Georgia's special efforts and the special value um, uh, in all that uh, development exercise, because today Georgia is not just a consumer um, and beneficiary of assistance, but we are proud contributor to security as well as development cooperation. We believe, like Croatia, there was a discussion about that, and there will be today also, that there are no small countries. Uh, we all have uh, duties to make contribution to the development, to the security, and to the better and safer world. And as an example, Georgia uh, is a proud and the second largest contributor to the NATO missions in Afghanistan. We've been successfully involved in uh, EU CSDP missions in Central Africa. We continue to be, in, to be engaged under EU CSDP missions uh, in Africa and uh, other parts of the world. And on the more soft dimension, we already started sharing our experience on the reforms on the good governance, anti-corruption activities, activities also related to the public service system development to all interested parties in the neighborhood and beyond, because we believe that this is the know-how that is developed in Georgia during very serious transformation process, and we are ready to present it to our partners. Uh, we also yesterday debated the importance of the energy security, and here Georgia is a very um, uh, active contributor to the European energy security as a, uh, as a reliable energy partner and the key actor uh, uh, which is committed to um, engage and actively participate in the projects like Southern Corridor to get, together with our neighbors of Azerbaijan and Turkey and beyond that uh, together with economic benefits definitely will bring more security and stability to the region. And also on the side of the, uh, the uh, gender equality and women participation, Georgia is making very serious steps and keeps this issue very high on the agenda. And we, uh, well, this year, um, uh, together with signing of uh, Istanbul uh, Convention that will be ratified very soon in the parliament, President launched 2015 as a EO Women, and Georgia will be hosting high-level international con conference, bringing together European neighborhood policy countries in Tbilisi to debate all the challenges of gender equality, role in the development, and women empowerment. So this is the agenda, which is uh, uh, very uh, busy, very complicated, considering the security environment that we live and operate, but there is very strong commitment will based on the Georgian choice, which is the choice of the population, uh, choice uh, the, driven by value-based decision, the civilizational choice to join the European Union, to join the NATO, and contribute to the stability, security, and the development in the region and beyond. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Foreign Minister. Uh, we started with one of the big success stories when it comes to development, uh, to providing development assistance. I mean, Turkey being the one uh, mid-income country, which is the biggest provider of development assistance. We are ending up with another of the big success stories, which is the United Kingdom. Uh, you are the first G20 nation to join the club of those providing 0.7, which is the uh, recognized target by the, by the UN, but there is not uh, many nations that join, uh, join that club but you have even now inscribed this into the law so that if any future government of the UK want to change it, it will have to start not by changing the budget, but by changing the law. Uh, that's an achievement which has been achieved by no one else. 
Uh, so the leadership of Prime Minister Cameron and other UK leaders here is really, really appreciated. The UK is now the second biggest provider of development assistance in absolute terms also, next to the, to the United States. So your leadership is uh, uh, much appreciated and other nations should definitely, definitely follow, follow you. I, I won't name all those nations who should follow you, uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really good. And yes, in, in, and it will happen at that time also, a lot of austerity in the, in the UK itself. So th thank you for uh, what you have done. Then now giving the floor to Baroness Anne of St. John's, who is the Minister of State uh, uh, at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office in the United Kingdom. But I know that you are also the special envoy for uh, issues related to, uh, to sexual violence in war wars and conflicts. So please, the floor is yours. And can I add my thanks to those of the other panelists to Croatia for hosting this forum uh, yet another year and giving us this opportunity to debate more international matters this year. It's, it's a valuable experience uh, for me indeed and uh, the UK values the opportunity to be here. Four years ago, a Tunisian street vendor set himself alight, triggering across the Arab world a series of revolutions. The Tunisian government made tremendous steps towards achieving a stable democratic government and towards building their economy. But against that background, they have continued to face the violent attacks of terrorism. The aftershocks are being felt not only in Tunisia, but around other parts of the world, whether it is ISIL Daesh or whether it is other terrorism. It seeks to, seeks to attack the very root of everything we all hold dear, and that is stability and good governance. The rise of Daesh ISIL and the horrific attack in Sousse last month, where we saw 38 people lose their lives, 30 of them citizens of my country, that reminds us that local problems of poverty and the lack of opportunity lead to violence which can affect our own citizens wherever they may be across the world. It means that we should all concentrate very carefully on how we do allocate our spending for foreign policy, security, defence, international development and more broadly I would say also for climate risk matters and sustainable development generally. Just yesterday, the Foreign Secretary in the UK had to advise British citizens to leave Tunisia and not to travel there. We know, we appreciate the impact that this will have on the Tunisian economy, and we took the decision with great regret against the background of new information about security problems. And when countries take that kind of decision, it's important that they, and that, by that I mean we, consider even more carefully how we balance our aid as against our security and how we coordinate our policies. We've always been resolute in defence of liberty and the promotion of good governance and stability around the world. And we do believe that stability, security, development are all inextricably linked. Cooperation between our institutions in the UK is therefore considered to be paramount, and we try to make it as seamless as possible. I know there are lots of uh, criticisms about governments around the world that it's difficult to make departments work with each other. But when it comes to these matters, it's essential we take every single practical step we can to do so. And as uh, Mr. Moderator, you've already referred to, we have put into statute law the duty for government to spend 0.7% of gross national income on international development. And it will be pretty much forever. I'm a member of the House of Lords, and I know how difficult it will be for any government ever to repeal that legislative commitment, because there is a majority of people there who are not elected who feel that they have responsibility widely to the public, who would uh, find it, I think, uh, unimaginable that any government should want to repeal that commitment. But also this week, our Chancellor of the Exchequer made another long-term commitment. In the budget, he announced that we would meet, meet our commitment to spend the NATO target of 2% of income on uh, defence spending, not just for this year, but for all five years of this government until we face the next general election. 
In April 2015, the National Security Council pulled just over one billion of new and existing resources from across government into our new Conflict Stability and Security Fund. The objective of that is to ensure that our foreign security and development policies are synchronized. And uh, we use our weekly meeting of the National Security Council as a regular opportunity for our senior ministers who have international responsibilities to discuss challenges and threats. And when I say international responsibilities, I include the Home Office when it, uh, it is dealing with migration and immigration matters, extremism and terrorism attacks both within the UK and outside, as well as the Foreign Office, the Ministry of Defence and the, the very important Department for International <laughs> Development. They're all briefed by senior officials and they ensure that they tackle the problems that are, need to be tackled in a coherent way. Uh, but let me close by just saying a brief word about a matter you referred to, Mr. Moderator, and that is that recently the Prime Minister appointed me as his special representative for the prevention of sexual violence in conflict. I'm very proud that I've been able to take on the work that was started so brilliantly last year by William Haig, uh, working closely with United Nations Special Envoy, Angelina Jolie Pitt. Responding to sexual violence and conflict of course requires a complex set of issues and that calls upon the best efforts of our diplomatic defence and development staff. <laughs> Just three examples. In Iraq, the, the Ministry of Defence is training 700 Kurdish security forces personnel in how to respond to and how to prevent <laughs> sexual violence in conflict there. Our Department for International Development has provided 39 and a half million pounds in humanitarian assistance to survivors in Iraq. And we know that there will need, need to be more. And the Foreign Office is supporting local human rights defenders through the training programs that we provide, including how to document cases of violence accurately. <coughs> it's so important to make it clear to victims that they can become survivors and that the perpetrators of the violence against them will not have impunity, that they will be hunted down and they will be brought to justice. But we can never de deliver any of our ambitions unless we act in a coherent way across diplomacy, defence and development. All our objectives need to be carefully aligned. That's our objective. Week by week we try to ensure that we achieve it, but I know it continues to be a struggle that all states want to achieve. Thank you. Th thank you so much. Thank you for highlighting the great UK contributions to the world, but also to highlight the appalling fact that uh, sexual violence is one of the most uh, <coughs> uh, evil, crucial, cruel uh, parts of, of, of men many recent conflicts, and we, we, need, we need to uh, fight it as with, with all, our, all our means. Uh, this debate is coming very close to the end. Is there anyone who is inspired to, by the others to make a final comment or to um, want to make, make a, just a few, few words at the end? Hungary, please. Uh, for, for just one second, uh, you mentioned uh, V4, and here I would like to mention the very deep commitment of uh, V4 countries working together in order to uh, um, assist um, Montenegro on its uh, way to uh, uh, NATO membership here, I would like to emphasize it very clearly that we do not see any reason why not to invite Montenegro into NATO this year. Any reason. Thank you. I guess that, that message was well received by Montenegro. I, I, would, uh, I, would. I have to say I'm, <laughs> I have to say I'm grateful actually and, and uh, to all my, all of my colleagues uh, uh, who have uh, brought it up and, and mentioned that, uh, Petra now, but also Igor, Tamar for her support, and everybody else, Mevluton, and all others. I mean, because it, it, is really, it is really incredibly important. And I think uh, it, it, the importance of that goes beyond Montenegro. It, it, it's important for the region. It's important for the other aspirant countries. It is important for, for, the, for the security Mediterranean. And we truly believe it's important for the NATO. Uh, uh, but again, what I'd like to emphasize to, 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 to be within the, 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 the framework of this panel 
is the, the more security, uh, the better, because the more security, the better platform and uh, more preconditions for the political stability, economic, economic progress. And that's our, our, our joint, joint goal of all of us. Thank you. Okay, uh, I think we can sum up the debate in a very, very clear uh, uh, sort, uh, set of thoughts, which is the following. Without peace and security, there will be no development. I mean, all the fantastic success stories of development over the, over the last years, I mean, the Koreas, the Singapores, the Chinas, the Turkeys, the Brazils, the Ethiopias, Rwandas, I mean, in, in many, many nations, in very difficult circumstances, but it's based on keeping peace, otherwise you, you, you cannot do it. On the other hand, to promote prosperity and affluence and development, always make the chance for going back to war or to initiate new wars much, much less likely. So the peace and development are absolutely interlinked. The African Development Bank has figured out that the average cost of development by a civil war in Africa is 30 years of development. If you start, if you embark upon a civil war, you are set back, th set back 30 years of development. So it shows the cost of, uh, of, of wars. And I think uh, one sentence says it all, and that is the following. Uh, if you think development is expensive, then try conflict. Thank you to a great panel.